When was the last time that you danced? Maybe it was recently at the reception of a friend's wedding. Or perhaps it was a long time ago. And when you danced, what did you look like? <laughs> Maybe you had a great look of confidence on your face, thinking to yourself that with just a little more practice, you could be on par with Fred Astaire or Ginger or maybe you look like a slightly subdued version of what you could have done years ago. Or perhaps you were one of those who just flails about, <laughs> letting the hair fall down in your face and letting your limbs go wherever they will. Last night, Dean and I were at Croke, and we saw a little boy dancing like that to one of the songs over the PA, having a great time until he realized that we were looking at him. And then he was a little embarrassed, a kid behind his dad. And today, in our passage from the sixth chapter of 2 Samuel, King David is dancing, something that we normally don't often associate with royalty. And he has reason to celebrate, because he is leading a procession into Jerusalem that will be the new capital of the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. It is strategically located in the center of these two regions. It was made capital for some of the same reasons Washington, D.C. became our capital, because it was centrally located in the 13 original colonies. And not only is it going to be the political and military center high up on a hill, but it's going to be the spiritual center as well. The Ark of the Covenant that we talked about last week is being led in in this grand procession. Jerusalem will now be where the throne of God will be housed. And so David has reason to celebrate as he dances into the city. But his wife was terribly embarrassed to see him do this. And her embarrassment went beyond just being embarrassed, and it created within her a disturbance that led to a very ugly exchange between the two of them that resulted in a rift that was never healed. What is it that made her so embarrassed to see David doing this? Maybe it's just the general idea that it doesn't look dignified when our leaders dance. Think back to when George W. Bush was first elected President of the United States. There was an African drum corps group that was there with the ambassador from their country on a reception at the White House lawn. And they were up there performing, and rather than just Standing back and watching, President Bush decided he'd get in and do a little drumming and movement too. Or think about how terribly awkward candidate Barack Obama looked before he was elected the first time when he went on Ellen DeGeneres' show and he tried to do some dance moves with her. <laughs> he looked just as silly as President Bush or as I do trying to do something like that. But it goes a little deeper than that because the writer of 2 Samuel gives us the details of what David was wearing. That he was wearing a linen ephod, which we imagine was sort of a light robe. So it could have looked to her eye the way it would look to us to see a leader dancing in a white t-shirt and boxer shorts. And so his wife is very, very embarrassed over this. Harold Kushner, in one of his books, is commenting on what may have gone through her mom. And he speculates that she might have been thinking, I grew up in the home of a monarch. My father, Saul, who was the predecessor to King David, would never have done anything this undignified. And here comes this shepherd from out in the country. And this is how he acts in his first public act. <coughs> I think, though, it says something about the nature 
of what David is doing. When the writer of 2 Samuel, at multiple points in this chapter, emphasizes the fact that King David is dancing before the Lord. He is leading a procession that will bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. <coughs> and in his celebration, he lays himself bare. Bill C. Davis's play, Mass Appeal, is written for just two actors. One is an older priest named Father Farber, and the other is a younger deacon, a seminary student named Deacon Dulce. And they are two very different kinds of people. Father Farley is someone who is highly disciplined. And Deacon Dolson is someone who is very spirited, but not quite as disciplined. They have a heated exchange throughout the course of the play. And Deacon Dolson is critical of Father Farley because he feels, feels like he has become complacent, that he's just more interested in being well-liked and being this sort of charming figure as a priest, and not properly challenging his congregation using his biblical prophetic voice. And Deacon Dolson is somebody who is very spirited, but does not know how to be tender and compassionate with the congregation. At one point, Deacon Dolson asked Father Farley, why have you taken an interest in me in the first place. And Father Farley says, because you're a lunatic. <laughs> One of those priceless lunatics that comes along every so often and keeps the church alive. The problem is with lunatic, he tells the deacon, they don't know how to survive. And I do. In Deacon Dolson's first sermon to Father Farley's congregation, he is mean-spirited, and he's condescending, and he turns the congregation against him. And Father Farley is trying to <clears throat> counsel him and ask why he would do that. And he says, well, I know what they can be, and it frustrates me that they're not living up to their potential. And then Father Farley, suddenly in epiphany, says, who are they to you? And he says... They are my people. I love them. I am concerned about them. But I just don't know how to help them. Father Farley said to Deacon Dulce, when St. Francis of Assisi first began his ministry, he gave away everything he owned and even took off his own clothes and gave them to the poor. That's what you need to do for this congregation. Just be completely naked and let them know how you feel about them. The advice that Father Farley was given the deacon is that if he was able to allow himself to be that vulnerable, then they would hear a harsh prophetic word more likely from him. And it's something that King David is setting the example for for us. Now I'm speaking metaphorically. But if we want to truly be converted by God, we cannot approach it with our defenses up. We have to be completely naked and vulnerable. Realizing that to truly come within God's presence means that we might be as embarrassed and as shameful as we were standing before Him wearing nothing. But that's the posture in which we approach God. Whether we are part of a crowd going down at the end of a Billy Graham crusade, as the choir sings just as I am, without one plea, or whether we are gathered here on a Sunday for worship, we come into this holy sanctuary realizing that in God's presence we can hide nothing. And we're only fooling ourselves if we think we are. And like King David, we come before the Lord completely stripped down. And our embarrassment and our shame 
is turned into songs of praise as you and I dance before the Lord. Amen.